Um, Tales from the Mall is, um, it's a funny old beast of a thing, really, because I've been working on it for three years, and um, it's funny as well that um, it seems to be about consumerism. Um, consumerism is something that's kind of bothered me all my life. Um, I was the child of, of uh, two hippies who moved as far north in the Highlands as they could possibly get to a place called Wick near John O'Groats. I mean, really, it's four hours to get to Glasgow from here. It's eight hours from Glasgow to Wick. Um, there are tourists who weep on buses at Inverness <laughs> trying to get to John O'Groats. And they've got another four hours to go. Um, but unfortunately, my parents made a huge miscalculation because not only was it the hippies that were trying to escape from the modern world, it was also the, uh, the nuclear establishment and the military industrial complex. So in their, in their desire to escape from the modern world, they ended up living five, year, five miles down the road from the biggest manufacturer of uh, plutonium in, West, in the Western world. And we used to have the jets flying over our utopian haven every day. So, so the whole idea of escape from consumerism and, and uh, capitalism has plagued me through my childhood and has been a... Sorry, there we go. We're having some adjustments. Okay, I'm going to turn the pages though. Let me stick it here. There we go. Yeah. Um, so it's been a, an ongoing concern for me, um, the whole idea of capitalism and escape. Um, this is a story uh, from Tales from the Mall called Baby Care. There are, it has been said, 82 types of person in the world. But people are not types, you might protest. They cannot be numbered. Such an idea is contemptible to any free-thinking person. A pseudo-scientific lie cooked up by market research companies to put people into boxes. To hide the radical fact that each and every individual is unique and free to forge their own future. This was certainly what Les's parents believed in the spring of 1970 when they celebrated the gift of her birth and named her in a non-gender specific way as an expression of their belief in social change and sexual equality. In demographic terms, Les's parents would have been seen as a fairly permissive middle-class college-educated ed couple with a single child, edgy blue-collar suburbs type D D22, also known as fa financially limited new hopers. But they would have scorned such reductive caricatures. Les's mother was a complex mix of many things, a feminist and a wild child, a would-be poetess and a part-time office worker in PR. Les's father, John, was a high school modern studies teacher who listened to Dylan and Johnny Cash and smoked a lot of pot. They were liberal and progressive and they bought handmade pots and fabrics from Mary Meko. Liz's first toys were made of wood and came from a radical new store called the Early Learning Centre because John and Kath were opposed to mass-produced products. As the responsibilities of child-rearing and the debts of the 80s started to replace the freedoms of the 60s, both Kath and John sought to reignite the old fires with secret lovers. Les's dawning awareness, awareness of her parents' infidelities grew as their own mutual antipathy increased. The usual tirades featured blaming each other for missing the boat, trying, <coughs> tying each other down, selling out and smashing the handmade crockery. Kath started to drink secretly, but not secretly enough for her 10-year-old daughter who found the many bottles her mother had stashed under the sink and behind the bookshelves. Les went to a state school, which was typical of her demographic, and went on to study a BA in liberal arts. Later, her parents became empty nesters after having stayed together for the sake of the child, which was typical of D22s. And then they divorced to reconnect with their own personal voyages, leaving Les with feelings of guilt and anguish and a profound desire for escape. She vowed she would never become like those selfish bloody fuckers. 
And so, after graduating with very little money, she took a year out and explored Europe, experimented with recreational drugs and tried out many new tongues. She fell in love with Yossi and Ivan, learned some guitar chords so she could sing along to Alanis Morissette and had an abortion. When the money was exhausted, she returned to her original city and got a flexi-time job in market research as a stopgap fallback thing and became one of the newly emerging group of people who worked in call centres and phoned total strangers to ask questions like, how often in a, in a week do you use a microwave? And do you have a cat, a dog, a pet rodent, or none of the above? <laughs> Indeed, at this time, Les wrote a story entitled None of the Above about a girl who didn't fit any, <coughs> any of the human categories she was rapidly learning about. She found the 82 types of person at first disturbing, things like L76s. These are multi-ethnic crowded non-residents. They live in third world shanty towns, work illegally and live with high inf infant mortality and diseases such as AIDS and cholera. They are the world's largest growth market for pay-as-you-go mobile phones. This was so sad and cynical that you had to laugh or you'd go mad. Others were just straight out weird. Her favourite was B-14s or happy families living in military enclosures. A reliable market for self-help books, <laughs> Disney toys and Ann Summers products. <laughs> These were actually facts and all written down in the staff Bible. Some weeks she'd have to do, to do nothing but phone B14 women and ask questions about bikini wax or floor polish. Other days it was J51s, otherwise known as grey perspective sepia memories. She liked asking them about their brands of chocolate and painkillers and gifts for the grandchildren from Argos. And they liked chatting to her because they were lonely, because 71% of J51s had lost a partner. Work paid the rent, which was in an apartment in the edgy mixed student slash immigrant area, type E28. Les was disturbed by the fact that her flatmates did listen to indie rock and did watch Will and Grace, like their demographic profile predicted. There were other things that disturbed her, like how a lot of research Info was harvested without anyone's consent from direct debit, credit and loyalty cards and even dating agency records. She didn't like any of this, but after many false starts at finding other kinds of work, she decided in her mid to late twenties that it was an easy regular source of income that gave her, free her freedom to experiment with alternative ways of living in her spare time. She then went through an excited and dizzying period dating many people from different places in the search for someone like herself. He didn't fit any of the boxes. There was Taz, an F-35, Sheena, an A-8, and Flack, a G-42. She slummed it with immigrants and had a brief amore with the symbols of success slash global connector, who with his pieter penthouses in several countries BMWs and share portfolios was a complete caricature of the type A1 slash 2 that he aspired to be. But he kept an old Play-Doh model of Kermit he'd made when he was four and Les found that redemptive for a while. Her ability to empathise with and adapt to other people was unique. Her faces and moods like her wardrobe changed weekly if not daily. Flared jeans for one date, an Armani suit jacket for the next, a Dolce & Gabbana dress for one, then Nikes and slacks for another. And when she talked to people from different backgrounds, although she did not like to admit this to herself, her market research experience helped in discussing the things they liked. She knew, for example, that E34s used Ecover and supported Greenpeace and that F-41s liked Star Trek, The Next Generation, and read Harry Potter 
even though they never had kids. It wasn't that she was two-faced. If anything, she was 82-faced or 32-faced, that being the number of lovers she'd had in her 20s, as was fairly normal for people or for demographic at this point in time. Les had a small breakdown in her 30s as her freedom experiment ran out of energy, leaving a great many discarded lovers and friends in its wake and some of those partners she was just plain scared of, like the G41s. Brands include Lacoste, Burberry, Buckfast, Farm Foods, Embassy Regal, Nike, Nintendo, a growth market for credit services. Others like the B9s had used her in ways she should have been able to predict in advance. After a late termination, her sixth morning after pill, in a case of chlamydia, she was told that she may have damaged her ovaries and might not be able to conceive. At this time, it must be said, she had amassed an encyclopedia of disappointments, traumas and personal tragedies, which included the death of her mother, having had her stomach pumped, a mugging and an HIV test. Safety, security, Family. These became the words she projected forward to meet in her future. Luckily for her, each fell into place like steps on the way. She got offered a full-time post, which at that time was to be coveted. And at 36, she became a market researcher proper with her own team and glass-walled office. Shortly after, as if prompted, Jason drifted into her life, unlike Sal and F23. He had emotional and financial stability. Unlike Hector, a C-16, he was without the burden of unattainable aspirations. Jason was a promising artist with a gentle disposition who did a bit of teaching and had come from a family of bees before drifting south to settle somewhere among the Ds. He listened to Cooks by David Bowie. They ate Doritos together in the bath and joked about spawning a generation of soggy, tortilla-eating little misfits. To Liz's joy, her first pregnancy test revealed that her years of experimentation had not left her barren. She wanted to call the child a creative, original girl's name, like Saffron or Jacasta. But Jason suggested a name less loaded class-wise, something simple and easy to say that might give the baby a head start in speech. And as they had chosen at the scan, not to be told if it was male or female, a unisex name would be ideal. They settled for Sam. Les and Jason wanted baby Sam's life to be uncluttered and they planned to buy simple wooden toys. The closest they could find were, from, were some from the early learning centre. Although they knew they were now mass manufactured, they had an authentic feel. The financial pressures of impending parenthood forced Jason to retrain as a high school teacher and for them to move to the fringes of the suburbs so they could have a garden for their newly born daughter. But baby Sam was colicky and screamy and would not wean and Les and Jason began to fight as chronic sleep deprivation overtook their new home. Les was prescribed sleeping pills which made her even more drowsy and lethargic during the day and resentful in the evenings. She felt isolated in the suburbs and to calm herself, she took to secretly drinking. Her depression was exacerbated by having to return to work and by political developments which her company was involved in. It was around this time that statistics revealed that the social ladder concept had collapsed. That there was only 7% social mobility in the UK and that 93% of the population, in spite of all promises to the contrary, would never escape their demographic box. At work while doing a demographic study for a controversial proposed inner city regeneration mall development in conjunction with the newly elected council planning department, Les oversaw research on the shopping patterns and values of the target market, D22. On screen, she saw the stat she saw the stat on screen she saw the stats 
map the lives of her parents exactly. During a phone survey of D22s, she then saw her own postcode come up as the most representative segment, then her own name and phone number. Alone at night as her child and husband slept, an empty bottle of wine beside her, Les counted out her sleeping pills and held in her hand the only way she could see that she could set her and her child free from their demographic destiny. She wept and after a time put the pills back in the jar and set the jar back in its place. She tiptoed through to the nursery and stared down at the little empty face. Above the child's whisper of hair were metal safety bars and above that a colourful poster. There was, a, there was a picture of an antelope then a big letter A. Then B was for bear. C was for cat. D, she couldn't see what D was for. Thanks. <laughs>